Hello everybody. I welcome you to a new talk on International Campus Waldorf. This talk has been recorded due to the time, time difference between Europe and New Zealand. This talk is from Neil Boland, a colleague from Auckland University in New Zealand. And Neil Boland has been, is, is originally from England and he has been a Waldorf teacher in, in Germany. And for a couple of years now, he is a lecturer, senior lecturer at Auckland University in New Zealand. And he is a visiting professor at Taiwan University. And today he is going to speak about the topic Waldorf education, a view from the periphery. I think this is a very um, crucial topic within our series of lectures, because for a long time, Waldorf education has been, so to speak, some kind of a European project. But Waldorf education has developed and has spread all over the world. There are more than 1,000 Waldorf schools all over the world. And by this development, it has changed. And there are new aspects coming in. And I wouldn't say that there is a periphery and a center anymore. I think everywhere there is a center of art of education. But nevertheless, there is a historical center, so to speak, in Europe. But nowadays, I think um, the question of periphery and center has changed. And I know that um, Neil Boland has a focus, in, on a research focus, on aspects which are not so traditional in wildlife education. So um, intercultural questions, questions of diversity, questions of minorities, all those aspects are very much important right now. And I'm very happy to have him, to have him here for a talk at the International Campus Waldorf. Thank you very much, Neil Boland. Hello and warm greetings to you from the early summer of New Zealand. I apologize for giving this short talk via recording. Time zones don't always work with you when you live on this side of the world. Most especially, I'm sorry that we won't be able to have a conversation afterwards. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to get in touch. I've called my talk, Waldorf Education, A View from the Periphery. And I did this while I was especially aware of the distances between New Zealand and the rest of the world in this time of lockdowns and travel restrictions. However, I believe the word periphery is a good one to think about in relation to Steiner education and raises a number of points which are worthwhile spending a bit, a bit of time unpacking. And so periphery. How might we understand periphery and what has it got to do with all of you living as I imagine you do not in New Zealand? There are many kinds of peripheries. First of all, there's the a periphery as an outer limit or boundary. This is the usual meaning, the periphery of a circle or of a geometrical shape. It's important, I think, to realise that uh, periphery only exists in relationship to a centre. Without a centre or interior area, you can't have a periphery. I live in what for you might be thought of as a peripheral place, as far as you can go without starting to come back. Of course, for me, if you're watching this in Europe, you are living at the periphery, as far as you can get away from where I live and work. This is standard. I am not certain where the uh, global periphery is uh, when you live in South America or when you live in Taiwan. More interesting is the question, is there a geographic Waldorf periphery? This uh, brings with it a, a notion of a Waldorf center, and how's that? I re recently heard that in the globalized world we inhabit, including the globalized Waldorf world, we've done away with notions of periphery. Internet connectivity and at least pre-COVID ease of travel has done away with the notion of distance. There is no longer a periphery. This is a nice and democratic sounding concept, but I'm not sure it is how things are on the ground. If I asked you to put a pin on the map where you think the Waldorf Centre is, if you think there is one, where would you put it? I bet that I can guess where that pin will be to within a few hundred kilometers. Do you think that's a fair thing to say? 
if we accept that maybe Waldorf centers and uh, peripheries do exist, what do they bring with them? What values, attitudes come with notions of center, with the idea of occupying the periphery? Are they based on history, on establishment, on geographic density? Are they based solely on, on merit and on excellence? Are there notions of depths of understanding, of knowledge, of wisdom? Do they carry with them any perception, consciously or unconsciously, of being further along the track, of, I could say, bitterness, of being more than? Are these qualities inheritable from other people? Uh, can they be inherited from generation to generation? How are they able to be transmitted? Are they based on proximity, on dominance of language? I'm very aware that while I'm speaking in my mother tongue, you may be listening in one of your additional languages. What might we find if we continue to unpack these ideas of Waldorf center and periphery? Thinking in this way likely has you imagining a globe of, of some sort, and also your relationships to and reactions to different areas of the world. But there are more interpretations of periphery which are worth our time and uh, for which you don't need to move outside your own geographies at all. Where all of us live, study and work, there are people who live on the social periphery, who do not inhabit the centre of society. I doubt if any of you are, uh, who are listening live in places which are monocultural or indeed monochrome where everyone you, uh, whom you pass on the street speaks the same language, has the same colour skin, has the same beliefs, the same customs, dresses in a similar way, has the same norms, the same expectations, the same values. So if I were to give you a few minutes to have a think, which groups would you say form as a social periphery where you live? groups and, and sections of society which are not in the centre but somehow on the edges. If you like, pause a video here and see if your list agrees with mine. If I'm to think of those on the social periphery here in New Zealand, uh, they would include, and this is in no particular order and also not um, complete, um, they include women, the poor, Indigenous people, those who are homeless, who are under housing stress, the un undereducated, LGBTQ+, disabled, the elderly, youth, minority religions, refugees, those who are visibly different, those whose language still, um, skills stop them participating fully in society, um, those who are food poor, who are hungry, the unemployed, otherwise marginalized, uh, the list goes on and on. Is that in any way similar to where you live? There are, of course, many points of intersection between these categories. Someone who is poor, female, of a minority religion and disabled, someone who's indigenous and gay and so on, they then can become multiply peripheralized, so to speak. Indeed, how many of us are ourselves in some way peripheral? have family members, friends, neighbours who are from these social peripheries. My question today is if and how this is reflected in Steiner education. Specifically, how is it reflected um, through our conceptions of Steiner education? In the Steiner education we teach or are taught about or which we ourselves received as students, does it ca uh, contain both a social centre and social periphery? Is it richly diverse, containing all the colours of the social rainbow? If it is, fantastic. I really wish that I lived where you do. What I would like to bring to your attention, if it's not there already, is the implicit and I think often unconscious visions of society which Waldorf education promotes. For me, this is important as um, Steiner education is at its heart part of a movement for social change, for the renewal of society, for changing society for the better. As this is the case, 
what social image is held in standard education is undoubtedly important, as it may indicate how we wish to renew society. Does our, uh, uh, does your mental image of what standard education is embrace the richness of society, including the groups I mentioned a couple of minutes ago? Does your image of, of what standard education is embrace what is gay, what is immigrant, what comes from, from ethnicities and cultures? Does it embrace the tensions of post-colonial thought? What do students in standard schools or standard teacher education institutions learn of the place, importance and value of uh, disenfranchised indigenous populations, those of minority religions, the plight of refugees, the consequences of European colonization, militarily, financially, culturally, do they figure much? Or is your vision of Waldorf education instead built on conventional existing power relationships between countries and between continents, or within countries between social groups? Does it seek to replicate the way the world is, intentionally or unintentionally? Does it strive towards a rebalancing of gender inequalities or stick with the status quo? To acknowledge the huge breadth of difference which exists in all our societies, work to lessen the oppression of minorities, whatever they are, or stick with the status quo. Do you see a need to acknowledge centuries of uh, colonial oppression which have greatly benefited some countries and some people at the expense of others, or stick with the status quo? Put bluntly, is the kind of Steiner education you envisage one that strives towards social renewal or social replication? Do we hang on to and think in terms of the concept of the nuclear family, mother, father, children, to the detriment of other kinds of families which exist in our communities? Now you may be thinking, what does all this have to do with me? I just want to teach. Myself, I don't think it's that straightforward. I agree with Paulo Freire when he said in his uh, 1968 book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, all education is political. Teaching is never a neutral act. I think Steiner really understood that. And that goes for water education as much as any other kind of education. In what ways then does Steiner education have what I would call a politics to it? I don't mean a politics in the sense of right wing or left wing or being allied to any political party or anything like that, but a politics in the sense of, of uh, projecting and promoting certain ways of seeing the world, certain ways of being, indicating the value of certain activities and relationships, valuing certain practices, certain points of view above others. This does not have to be overt. It can happen in many ways. This politics then leads me to what lies on the peripheries of Waldorf education. We talk about the Waldorf curriculum as if it's a fixed thing. This isn't the case, nor is it common to all schools, even though we might presume that it's something we share across countries. Each country, it's each school has its own version. Be that as it may, I want to talk about other kinds of curricula here, not the Waldorf one. The first is a hidden curriculum, and I'll just go over this quickly in case it's a new concept for you. Apologies to uh, those of you who, who know this already. Though aspects of the hidden curriculum were first identified by uh, John Dewey around 100 years ago, the term is usually credited to Ben Snyder, who wrote about it in 1970, and since then it's come into general educational parlance. The hidden curriculum is the sum of the unintended hidden lessons which we learn at school. The norms, the values and beliefs which are conveyed to us when we're young in multiple ways. The hidden curriculum is how we learn what is accorded value in our society. The behaviours which are rewarded and which are not. What is thought of as beautiful and what is not. It accords status and often reinforces existing inequalities, even if the teachers and the school are consciously striving for the opposite. I learned things like 
A good child sits quietly in school, is polite and puts their hand up. Boys become doctors, girls become nurses. People who come from my group are trustworthy. People who are different from me, less so. These lessons are repeated daily in a thousand different ways. The hidden curriculum is found in advertising, indeed advertising more or less relies on the hidden curriculum and in movies. It's different for everybody, but for everyone is a reality. Stereotypes are challenged now more days um, than ever before, yet they still persist, including in Waldorf schools. What might a Waldorf a hidden curriculum contain? It has to, has to be something, but for me, becoming aware of it is the important thing. Whose songs are sung in class? From which cultures? Which groups? Given that you likely live in societies which are, to a greater or lesser extent, multicultural and multi-ethnic, whose songs aren't sung? Whose festivals are celebrated and whose are not acknowledged? Whose cultural capital is promoted and whose is ignored? Who, whose culture's artwork is up on the walls and whose is missing? Which groups are represented on the staff, on the board, and which are missing? None of this exists in any printer curriculum, yet it teaches children very effectively what is seen to hold more value and what holds less. Our stories told about um, men and women in equal proportion. An interesting study done a few years ago about how many roles in class plays um, there are major roles that are for boys compared to girls. How, how do women feature in your programmes, let alone uh, people of colour, LGBTQ+, and so on? A few years ago, I was speaking at a conference in the States, and before each day's talk, an ex-student got up and talked about an aspect of standard education from their experience. On day two, a young Chinese-American woman came to the front to talk about her world of experiences. She had gone through from kindergarten to uh, class 12, had loved school, loved her teachers, and had a great time. Then she went to university and had some time to reflect. She realised that, in the 12 years she'd been at a Waldorf school, no teacher had ever mentioned a Chinese-American in any context, and that's not a small minority in the United States. In her, her own education, her own group was invisible they didn't merit mentioning. No Chinese American was mentioned as doing anything worthwhile. They didn't exist. And it was for her shock to realize, and then she decided she was going to take the opportunity to tell the more than 500 standard teachers in the conference that, though they were all good people, being well-intentioned was not good enough. Speaking on behalf of the people of her generation, that's what she said, and she said, you have to do better than this. We demand that you do better than this. Uh, I was the next speaker and she was not an easy act to follow. It was a, a, one of the most powerful speeches I've ever heard in my life. I'm sure this can be told many times over from different angles. How do gay students learn about being gay? How do African students learn about the richness of African cultures? How do Muslim students learn about how they benefit society? How do all students learn about those of minority religions? Indeed, how does anyone learn about those who are other? I have a couple of ideas about that, which I'll get to shortly. So that is the hidden curriculum. The second of the three curricula I want to mention is perhaps less talked about, although it's still allied to the hidden curriculum, and that is the null curriculum, N-U-L-L. Um, the null curriculum is what is not taught. It comes from Elliot Eisner from 1994. Um, it's what is missing from learning, what students don't have the opportunity to learn. In this case, students are le learning something based on the absence of certain experiences, certain interactions or certain discourses in the classroom. This is a good thing to ask older students. 
What is your world of education not covered, which would have been of value? We, clear, we I clearly can't cover everything, but it's a good question nonetheless. My hunch is that a lot of this would be contemporary issues, perhaps the kind of mentioned here, which weren't such an issue, um, such an issue a few decades ago. And for those of you in a world of training institutions, what is not covered in your courses, which you think could be or should be? You don't want to be learning how to teach forever. But again, it's an interesting question. The third curriculum is actually my favorite, um, the saber tooth curriculum. It's a fictitious Stone Age curriculum and is one that looks at how what is taught to meet the needs of uh, communities at one time is then adapted or not. Um, as situations change. It's essentially an outcomes-based educational principle. In the Sabretooth curriculum, the original subjects were fish grabbing, horse clubbing, and scaring saber-tooth tigers with fire. As times changed, there were no more horses and saber-tooth tigers died out. The bears that came um, weren't scared of fire. So, does the curriculum change or does it stay the same? Um, is the intrinsic importance of scaring saber-toothed tigers still valuable, even though saber-toothed tigers no longer exist? This is relevant to Steiner schools. What can you identify from your own educations which had a saber-toothed quality? For me, it was learning Latin and Greek for years. They were my favorite subjects, but they had very little immediate relevance. Balancing the saber tooth curriculum with the null curriculum needs constant attention. So taking all of these things, how might we practically approach ideas of center and periphery, as well as the hidden, the null and the saber tooth curriculum? I think that hints of this can be found in the movement out of which Steiner education emerged, the movement for social renewal or threefold social order. There are lots of ideas which I could take here, but I'm going to uh, just limit myself to two. In Towards Social Renewal, which is the latest translation of GA23, we read, people do not always judge their own motives and impulses correctly. Page 19. People don't always judge their own motives and impulses correctly. This applies to everyone. How can you become um, ever more aware of your own motives and impulses, what actually um, the foundations of your values are? To dive down into your values and examine them. As uh, the Australian comedian Tim Minchin once put it, you need to take your values outside and hit them sternly with a cricket bat. Don't take them for granted. This for me speaks uh, to the Steiner graduate in Washington who told all the teachers assembled that being people of goodwill was not enough. You have to do better than this. How then can we work towards actually managing this? Um, a couple of pages later in Towards Social Renewal, we, we find this now, page 21. All those who think about the proletariat rather than with it have only the vaguest notions, notions which can have a harmful effect. All those who think about the proletariat rather than with it have only vague notions which can be harmful. Stein is speaking here um, about well meaning people hoping to help the proletariat the working class wanting to do good if you only think about them you want to teach about them you want to do things for them that can be unhelpful because it keeps them at a distance it keeps them firmly at the periphery adding things to the curriculum look at the fantastic things this person um, from whatever minority did keeps the person and that minority at arm's length. It doesn't draw them into the centre. For students in schools or in institutes who identify with, the, with this minority, it reinforces the understanding that they're peripheral, 
not of importance. For others, it reinforces that for this group, excellence is the exception and not the rule. What is needed is to work with people. If there are groups in your communities, inside the school or in wider society, who are not included in your school's programs, contact them and take their advice. Work with them, include them. A friend's um, school decided to walk in the local pride parade to support their LGBTQ colleagues and students. It was a very straightforward thing to do. Waldorf Institutes can also, um, if, if they choose to, walk in local pride parades. Does anyone do it already? What kind of message would that give to, to um, both students and faculty who are LGBTQ? Groups who are on the periphery can then be brought into the centre. I think that is powerful education in any context. So long as the centre, a dominant group or geography says, but we are where the knowledge lies, this is how it is, we're going to be in difficulty. Centres and peripheries need to come together, work together. The centre goes out to the periphery, the periphery becomes the centre. Um, if you're interested to see Steiner's Jewish, um, uh, Jewish Education course, Lecture 10. So those are a few thoughts on what periphery might mean in the Steiner educational context. The uh, gesture of motion between centre and periphery is essentially social. We all experience centres and, uh, and peripheries of different kinds. Let's try to work with them so they don't become fixed, or what for me is worse, that they remain unseen and are not able to be challenged. Thank you for your attention. And don't um, hesitate to get in touch if you have any questions. And warm greetings from the summer sunshine of Aotearoa. Sure.